Hello, everybody. Let's have a Bible class. What do you say? Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, and I want to talk to you tonight about, uh, this is the sixth one of the Ephesian uh, Bible classes, and I want to talk to you tonight about a variety of things connected to Ephesians 1, and not the least of which I mentioned um, two of them last week. I mentioned uh, uh, talking about what Paul wrote and when, and, uh, and I mentioned also about the, uh, the appearance of the three inheritances. And I hope to get to both of those things here tonight. Because I'm not going to do a great big long study about when Paul wrote what. But I am going to talk about that a little bit. One of the greater pleasures we have here tonight is that Jerry and Betty Curry are with us in live and in person right here in the studio. So <laughs> we're really happy you're here. And these guys on here, they, you know, they're a little hard to, they, they just throw really tough questions at me. So you please don't do that. Tonight. These guys online, they give me enough tough, tough questions. Uh, anyway, appreciate everybody being here and uh, anyone else who comes in. And, and um, always remember that if you miss somebody here tonight and they want to know, uh, is it going to be on YouTube? You can tell them it's on Brother Jerry Lockhart YouTube. And it'll be up on the YouTube channel by tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. All right, I want us to start reading in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, the word all is the great big one, but I want you to notice he hath blessed us. It's not a matter of finding a blessing. It's not a matter of asking for one or praying for one. It's a matter of understanding that you've already got them. And please notice the third thing is that these blessings are spiritual blessings in heavenly places. There are spiritual blessings here on the earth. That's true. There are physical blessings here on the earth. That's true. Yet all of that pales in comparison to the spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In other words, like this. What would be the greatest spiritual blessing in heavenly place you could think of? And that would be eternal life. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that we are going to have a spiritual body. There is a natural body, he said, and there is a spiritual body. Well, we're going to have that spiritual body. Well, we're going to go into heavenly places, by definition. And we're going to go in there with all spiritual blessings already being there. And many times people lose sight of the fact that the spiritual blessings are already there. Whether you notice them here or not is irrelevant. They're already there. So people say, well, that sounds mystical. Nah, sounds like the work of the Lord to me. Look over in chapter 2. In chapter 2, we'll start reading in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Now, the mind-boggling thing about that, and uh, y'all on the, on the, uh, watching the video here tonight, the live, you probably noticed that I took all of these, the books of the Bible I had up here, I took all of that off here, we've got a clean slate here tonight. And that's because I want to, well, it's because of several things I wanted to do. But first of all, one of the things that I want to do here is talk about being quickened together with Christ. Now, even though we've got a cross up there on the timeline, I want to bring it down here and put the cross here for everybody to see because we out here normally in a parenthesis, and I'm going to use a bracket just to be different, just to be argumentative, we are out here. You know, Paul was in the first century and Others were in the 5th and 10th and 15th and 18th and 19th, 21st. And here we are. We are in this inside this bracket. And yet everyone inside this bracket, from the Apostle Paul until the day we go out of here, everyone in here is in Christ and blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And bigger than that, we are... Verse uh, 6, 
when we were dead in sins, he, God, hath quickened us together with Christ. Whoa. Quickened us together with Christ? Yeah. Christ was quickened in his 33rd year, three days and three nights after being crucified. He was quickened. He was made alive. And he ascended up to heaven, sent back the Holy Spirit, comes over here, talks to the Apostle Paul, and tells the Apostle Paul at one point, tell everybody that they were quickened with me. We're quickened with Christ. Well, when did we get saved? The moment we trusted Christ as our Savior. How did it work? How come that worked for our salvation? Because we had already been quickened with Christ. Say, aha, that's predestination. Oh, no, that's God's foreknowledge. I go out here and I meet 50 people on the street. I say to all 50 of them, are you saved? And 47 of them tell me no. I stomp off and say, 47 lost people. Never say another word to them. Then I go to be with the Lord, and I see some of them. And I say, how'd you get here? You told me you didn't, you were lost. Told me you didn't, you were not saved. Well, somebody told me the gospel, and I believed it. See, I could give up on 47 people. The Lord doesn't give up because the Bible says the foundation of God stands as sure having this seal. He knows who are his. So if I don't preach him the gospel, somebody else will. So, you know, a predestinationist once told me, he said, I found somebody. I hated that terminology after I thought about that a while. I said, what do you mean you found somebody? He said, well, I found somebody that was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. I said, well, how many did you preach to that weren't? He says, oh, I don't know. Well, listen, folks, you don't need to know. What you need to do is to be able to tell them how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and was buried and was raised for our justification, according to the Scriptures. If they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they'd be saved. And you know what? I found it astounding to be standing and talking to somebody about this and have them ask me questions. So I come back with something else and show them a slightly different direction here of how to put themselves into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved. And then all of a sudden, somebody sitting over here listening gets saved. Just listen to me talk to somebody else. Happened at Bible camp one time. This lady, she kept waving her hand. And finally I looked over at her and she said, I trust him. <laughs> and, and then it happened another time. I was talking to a lady who claimed to be Jewish. I uh, think she had made herself some kind of a Jew in her own mind, but I, I don't really know about that. But a young man, about 25 years old, sitting over there listening to it. And, and about a week later, his dad got saved, went home and told his son that. He said, I just got saved. He said, well, I did too. The other night when Jerry was talking to so-and-so. You don't know who's going to believe. So who do you tell the gospel of Christ to? Everybody. Why? Because it's a done deal where the Lord's concerned. Not a done deal where we're concerned. So we, everybody in here, were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's true. But we were quickened. We were made alive when Christ was made alive. Quickened together with Christ. And then look at the next verse. Verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm standing in the middle of a retail store here tonight. You guys are in various comfortable positions there. Do we seem like we're in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? No. But are we? Verse 6. Hath raised us up. Hath, hath is past tense. Just like in chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us. Chapter 2, verse 6. Hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So now I want to turn this. Let me get a paper towel. I want to turn this around just a little bit. I've got all this depicted here as being in this bracket as us in, in, inside the body of Christ, and we're still alive. We're still here. Well, let's do it like this. We're going to have 
the earth, sky, starry heavens, and then far above all heavens, and there we are. Now imagine, imagine getting this letter from Paul. You are a far off Gentile, and you get this letter. Now, there's a lot of things that when we start, like when if you were to go someplace, you know, as Brother Moore used to say, lower Slavovia and start a Bible class, and you started in the book of Ephesians, there would be more questions than you could handle. But these guys, these guys Paul wrote this book to, they didn't know the law. They didn't know how to follow Israel. They weren't connected to them in any way. And this is the book they got. Well, here's the thing they had to do. They had to say to whoever was their teacher, okay, let's get this book, this, this letter that Paul wrote us here, and let's analyze what we're seeing. I mean, we are, we're tradesmen. We know we're smart guys. We've been in the world. We know what the world is like. And this guy says, you're seated together with Christ in heavenly places, and we like that idea, but we don't know about that. So what are we going to do? How are we going to understand this? And so if their teacher is wise, instead of concentrating them on, uh, uh, concentrating his te teaching on them being far above all heavens, he puts them right back into a, a living, breathing, earthbound church, the body of Christ, stuck here <laughs> for a certain length of time. They're just going to have to stay here. Now, <clears throat> when we get to it, and out of this might be the last half of the year, I don't know. When we get to it, that's that is basically Ephesians four, five, and six. So we're a long way from it. But if I was sitting there in one of these assemblies in Ephesus, and I didn't have the first twelve books that Paul wrote available to me, I'd be asking, where can I find them? So from about as far as we know. It could be much earlier than this, but from about A.D. 88, the order of the books in the Bible, Romans, Philemon, were in the same order they are now. So all of a sudden then, we, the church, the body of Christ, who knows that they have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and they know they're seated together with Christ in heavenly places. And they know it's been that way since Christ was resurrected, but they don't know how to treat their brother. They don't know how to lay the foundation for somebody to get saved. So, well, they just got saved by grace through faith. That's exactly right. They did because they were willing to trust Christ. But they heard the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, right? Chapter 1, verse 13, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You go to these last seven books that Paul wrote over here, the way I separate them, and find me that gospel of truth, that, that word of truth, the gospel of their salvation, in those seven books. Got to go deeper. So now I want you to go back, and, and, you know, I don't think this is an accident. The book that is right next to the Ephesian letter, the Ephesian letter being the last one written to a group of people, a people who were, who were doomed and damned and lost and on the road to hell because they had no connection with Israel, and somebody preached to them that Christ died for their sins anyway, and in their Bible, the letter right next to their letter is the Galatians. Go back to Galatians chapter 1. 
it's possible, I don't know that this is true, but it's possible that someone came along with a copy of the book of Acts. And if they did, the people of Ephesus could have seen when Paul went to this area, Galatia. They could have seen that. Galatians appears to be, to me, and I stand by this, and you, if you disagree with me, it's okay. There's no, no reason to part company over a thing like this. I believe Galatians is the first book Paul wrote because of the, the current events that he mentions and the most recent event that he recalls um, that he had been involved with, and then uh, he, the rebuke that he lays on the Galatians. It's strong. In, verse, in chapter 1, verse 6, he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Wow. Well, who's going to do a thing like that? Well, somebody that thought they had something to gain from it. That's who want to do it. So, well, why would they do it? Because they wanted the gain. So, wow, I, you know, that sounds con uh, condemning. Well, it is condemning. You know, uh, Brother Jerry and I were just talking about uh, favorite verses, and I, I was reminded of, of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 4, uh, verse 7, I think it is. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I like that verse. It keeps reminding me I'm not the one with the saving knowledge. I'm just a voice. I'm not the one with Bible knowledge. I'm just reading and repeating and on and on. You understand? I'm not a big eye. I'm a little eye most time without the dot. And my point there is not that I want to put myself down, but that I cannot put myself up. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. It's clay. That stuff right there. It's clay. Not worth a flip. You stop the blood. You see, we're just usable. And Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from the simplicity that's in the gospel of Christ. And I mixed it up there just to get through this. And somebody that wants to pervert that gospel is doing this to you. Well, what he said was, I marvel that you are so soon removed. Who caused you to be that way, he's saying. Go over to chapter 3, verse 1, and he says, Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Why did they get bewitched? Now, to our Ephesian friends who want to see the basics of this, they don't know anything about being bewitched. They came out of that. They quit that. They're no longer doing that. But somebody come along and would bewitch these Galatians? Why, if I were an Ephesian reading this for the first time, I would think, good grief, why didn't they hold on to what they had? Good question. Most of the time, the reason they don't is that religion seems pretty good to them. The Ephesians probably wouldn't have had this problem. You know, over the years, I've seen people go, come out of some really binding religion. You know, some, like, a, like for instance, in some sort of a strong Pentecostal faith that has them duped by several different things. And I've seen them see enough truth that they come out of that. And at first, they're, when they come out of that, at first they're totally bewildered, as in, I'm so thankful. How could anybody have ever, how could I have ever believed that? And they go on. And then after a while, they say, well, you know, they weren't all wrong. They had a little bit of, they had a few things right. And there you go, oh gosh, I see them slipping. Because it's better that they see it all wrong. So is it all wrong? Yeah. Filled with leaven. A little leaven? Leaven's the whole lump? A little bit. So anyway, those who would pervert the gospel of Christ have attacked these Galatians, and now what, what I've done 
in, in my scenario is to take these naive and yet free Ephesians and brought them back over here to study the basics. So sometimes you have to get around the briar patch to find the picnic, you know what I mean? So there it is, He's, verse six and seven, he can't believe these people have done this. And so then he gets himself and anyone else that's in the way, out of the way. Verse, seven, uh, verse eight, but though we, him and uh, the brethren which are with him in verse two, he says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. I want you to remember something now. In, in Galatia, he was there about 11 years. And somewhere between 8 and 9 or 10 or maybe even 11 different churches. You add them all up and put them together. And he says, if they change you from the gospel we preached before, let them be accursed. Again, at the end of verse 8. Any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. You know, it's amazing to me how many people in the religious world will not take that literally. They want that word, we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than what we have preached. They want that to be them instead of Paul. That's called spiritualizing to the nth degree right there. So then he goes, he says it again in verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that that you have received, let it be accursed. So he gets himself out of the passage and lets it be what you received. He knew what these people received. He knew who they were. He knew where they were. <clears throat> and he writes back to them in a collective sense because he wants everybody to get this message that he's telling. So the very next thing he does, of note to what we're talking about is in verse 11 and 12. And if you were an Ephesian reading this the first time, you'd really like this. It says, but I certify you brethren that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul preached what he preached because it was a revelation from Jesus Christ to him. Sometimes in Trying to get people to understand what Romans to Philemon is worth to them. Uh, I, and I'm not, not exclusive, many other grace preachers do the same thing. We use the terminology. It was that it is the doctrine that was delivered to, through, and by the Apostle Paul. You see, the, the, the reason to use three different prepositions to describe what Paul was doing is so it's mo the most distinctive it can say, you can say it to the Apostle Paul, through him, and by him. You know, when he said, necessity is laid upon me to preach the gospel of Christ, I think we read that last week, he said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Christ. Then he said, I have a dispensation of the gospel, which means that until the dispensation is fully defined with the gospel as its main point, he wasn't done. A dispensation of the gospel was committed to Paul. Just like a dispensation of God about the completed word of God was committed to Paul. Well, think about those terminologies. Dispensation? A dispensation is a manner of dispensing, a form of uh, attitude, style, or whatever of, di of dispensing. It is a matter of getting out the word. Now, once again, we're bringing this naive and brand new Christian saved according to the words preached in Ephesians chapter 1, and you're putting him back into school here for him to learn how to discern Paul's doctrine. Well, he's going to find things in the book of Galatians that he doesn't fit into. And he knows it. And so he hearkens back to what he knows best, and that is that his salvation is based upon the word of truth. And he's taught by Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth. 
And so he sees, when he gets over to Galatians chapter 3 and 4, and he sees things that he can't be into, he was never allied with Israel. He can't be called a child of promise. He can't be likened unto Isaac. He can't do that. And so he has to back off and say, was this book really written to me? And if he's got a good teacher, say, yes, it is written to you, but you must rightly divide the word of truth. The word of truth is the gospel that Paul preached, and it's in here. And an explanation of it is in here. But the other things that are in this book are not going to match what Paul wrote to you about the book in the book of Ephesians, is it? No, it's not. Well, then there's some things in the book of Galatians you can't claim. Well, why did he write them? Because it was the first thing that Paul wrote. And he wrote it to people who were both Jew and Gentile and in the body of Christ, who were being hampered by people who wanted them to be more Jewish than to be more body of Christ. And so it is with the first five books that Paul wrote as said in contrast to the last seven books that Paul wrote. Now that, that's a long and arduous study, and we'll do it bit by bit. We'll do it a little bit at a time. And for tonight, I want you to see one more thing in Galatians. And look, that's in Galatians chapter, we're going to look in chapter 4, and then look in chapter 5 for just a minute. So look in chapter 4. In Galatians chapter 4, he says, in verse uh, 8, Paul writes to these Galatians. Now think about being a, an Ephesian, which you are. You're like an Ephesian. Think about being an Ephesian and seeing these words. How, verse 8. How be it then? When you knew not God. Well, you'd know, who that, you'd know when that was. That was just two weeks ago before you heard the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto your salvation. He says, how be it then? When you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. And every Ephesian would know what that was because the Ephesians were idolaters. They, they made little gods for people to carry around in their hands and all that sort of thing. They were filled, the city was filled with idolatry, wholly given over like Athens was to idolatry. And so Paul says to them in verse 8, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods back then. And then he says in verse 9, but now, always remember, but now marks a decided change. You cannot say that it is a reference to uh, just one more thing being added, it is a reference to a great change. All, all the time that but now is used in your Bible. Verse 9, but now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye, these Galatians, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. When I found out that I was an Ephesian is when I understood that what the weak and beggarly elements were was religion, and it was a religion is a is a bondage factor, and observing days, months, times, and years is all a part of the scheme. Did you ever notice the uh, a calendar? If you if you get a calendar from certain religions, and you can get uh, you, you can get this kind of calendar in practically any Christian bookstore. But it'll be uh, geared so that they don't offend anybody, whether they be uh, Catholic or Lutheran or um, Episcopalian. Uh, and you'll find dates named Saint So and So's Day. Sunday, certain Sundays. They have days that are named in favor of their rituals. Um, and they took the word, they took a very good word and att attached it to, to days in the year. They took a word that said something you should expect. If the word is Advent. They took the word Advent. Advent. What could you add to Advent to understand it better? Oh, you could add U-R-E, adventure. Advent has to do with an appearing or a coming. And so, high church religion calls the first, the fourth Sunday before Xmas Day. I said that on purpose. Uh, they call the fourth Sunday before first 
Advent Sunday. Why? I would rather have Advent Tuesday. I'm going to do Advent Tuesday. How many people you think would come over and do something special with me on Advent Tuesday? Nobody. Oh, then let's do it on Sunday then. It's about that simple, and it means absolutely nothing. Why in the world should anyone think more of Jesus Christ on those four Sundays, the fourth, the third, the second, the first, whatever, first, second, third, fourth, whatever it is, why would that be something special? Paul said, I'm afraid of you, you who observe days. Well, that had hit me, the vision here. That had hit me, right? I got, I got that one. I understand that one fully. Now that I know God, or rather I know not God, I'm not turning again to those weak and beggar the elements. I'm out of them. I'm an Ephesian. I'm saved like an Ephesian saved. I'm out of those days. I'm going to quit observing days and months and times and years. I've seen people come through many, many years of standing firm against all these days and this and that, all this other thing, their holidays and holy days and on and on and on. They stand against it and then they get tired. Well, I just have to resist my family all the way through that. Well, I got the freedom to do it. I'm just going to do it anyway. It's not hurting anything. Kind of fouls up the Ephesian testimony, doesn't it? Yeah, fouls up the Ephesian testimony. Well, that's just too bad. I like it enough to do it. I'm going to have my 25-foot Christmas tree in a 20-foot room. Wait, that won't work. I'm going to have Easter egg hunt in my lawn, whether anybody likes it or not. And I just love St. Patrick's Day. You know, he was a good guy. By the way, he was. Why did they have a day for him? Why did we name a day after St. Patrick? Or St. Valentine? Woo, coming up. Look at all this red stuff here. I'm not, listen, folks, I'm not trying to bind you to something. I'm trying to get you to understand between, a, between a, a message that Paul preached to the Galatians, who should have known all these things, and obviously went back to the weak and beggarly elements they had been in before. But the Ephesians, they were never in those weak and beggarly elements. They'd come out of paganism to trust Christ as their Savior. Once again, think about it. The contrast between the last book that Paul wrote to a group of people, Ephesians, and the first book that he wrote to a group of people, Galatians. Go back now. Look in Ephesians. I'm sorry. Look in Galatians chapter five. He sort of comes through all this, arguing with these people. At one point back there in chapter four, he said, "Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth?" Boy, you got to think about that for a moment, don't you? But look in chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Wow. That's a biggie. And it's like Paul has gone through chapter 2, 3, and 4, mainly 3 and 4, and he's sort of settled down here in writing to the Galatians. Again, I'm, a, I'm an Ephesian, a saved Ephesian, former idolater, and I'm seeing these things written to the first group of churches that Paul wrote to. And I see, oh, there it is. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the open bondage. And now I can see myself. I can see myself. With an Ephesian, I mean, with a, a, an Ephesian eye, with a Galatian group of people. I need to... Obey chapter 5, verse 1. Whether I'm so free of idolatry or not, I need to remember chapter 5, verse 1. Is this book, Galatians, is this worth anything to the Ephesians? You better believe it is. And it's filled with other things like chapter 6, verse 1. And uh, chapter 4, verse uh, um, uh, 1 through 6, which I didn't bother to read. And chapter 3, verse... Uh, uh, 6 through uh, 19, 18. All about justification by faith and on and on. All these things are valuable. Why? Because the Lord put you, me, like Ephesians, 
into the same body of Christ that he put all these Galatians. We're in the same body. Isn't that wild? Yeah, that's really pretty wild. But we are all in the same body. And so he wrote them in the order. He wrote them Romans through Philemon. And they've always been that way. So what's the worth of it? The worth of it is steady to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if you rightly divide the Old Testament from the New, if you rightly divide Peter's kingdom gospel from Paul's body of Christ gospel, then for heaven's sakes, rightly divide Paul's epistles from the first five to the last seven. That's your assignment for the week. You can get that done in a week, right? Go back to Ephesians. Look at Ephesians 2 now. That's not much to do. Week, you got seven days. You don't have to take uh, about eight and a half chapters a day to get that done. Ephesians chapter 2. When Paul showed... That middle wall of partition we talked about last week, when he showed that gone, and he, he tells them why it's gone. And I'll pick up right there, verse 16. Here's why God did it. That he, God, might reconcile both those who first trusted in Christ and those who also trusted later. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Not at the cross, on the cross, through the cross, of the cross, by the cross. There it was. And by that means, that took place in AD 33, that means he provided this. Here he is writing this roughly uh, AD 67, 66 maybe. And that's what he said. He made both unto God, reconciled both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity, which is the commandments contained in ordinances, and slain the enmity thereby, by that cross. That's why it's by the cross, not on the cross, or at the cross, or to the cross, or of the cross. Verse 17, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off. I'm not sure Paul even knew how this occurred. He didn't need to know how it occurred. He just needed to know that it had occurred and he needed to write this book. So if he knew how it, how it had occurred that these people afar off heard the gospel of Christ, he doesn't bother telling us. Verse 17, came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh, for through him, that's Christ, for through him we both, Paul's in the first group, writing to the second group, we both, have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, from there on, he tells something here that is a total mystery. A total mystery. You know, he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when he said there were things that he couldn't tell, he said he would come to visions and revelations. And he said the reason the Lord wouldn't let him tell it because it was because of the abundance of the revelations. And we went over that about three weeks ago. The abundance of the revelations is what Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when he said, it is unlawful for a man to utter this. I will say the truth, but now I forbear. There was an abundance of the revelations given to him that he could not speak. Well, I'm fixing to get into it with you right here. Chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, ye, these Ephesians, people like you and me, now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also, what's the word also? In whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, I don't believe, I'm going to draw this on the board in a manner that I don't believe it is. 
And I'm going to draw it the way I think it will help explain it. You see what Paul is talking about based upon verse uh, uh, 19 is who are the fellow citizens in the whole household of God? Who are they? Now, nobody ever wrote about this before. And he writes about it in a few short words. To remind you of that, look at chapter 3. Verse, uh, well, just read from verse 1 in chapter 3. For this cause, I Paul, for this cause, remember that phrase. For this cause, I Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now watch, there's a semicolon there, which means there are several phrases or facets of the rest of, of following words that need to be understood to get the picture of made known unto me the mystery. If not, this is not words writ previously written down. You wouldn't put a semicolon there. It's words he's yet going to write. You want to understand some things about how God made known unto Paul the mystery? You're going to have to read some words from here on down. Is that going to exclude anything that he's done before? No. It'll answer things he's said before. Now notice, there's the semicolon, and then he has this parenthesis, which, by the way, would not be considered, grammatically, it would not be considered to be a part of the meaning of the semicolon. This parenthesis is to explain the need for the semicolon. And it says, inside the parentheses, as I wrote a four in, uh, as I wrote a four in few words, whereby when ye read, then I know that he a four wrote a few words that these people need to read. Well, I also know, biblically speaking, the only thing he wrote to these people before chapter 3 was chapter 1 and chapter 2. That's the only thing he wrote to them. <laughs> That's easy. Back up and start over. <laughs> so he says, as I wrote for a few words whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Okay. Here is the foundation of the world. Here is, we'll say, uh, we'll go to Genesis and Malachi, right there. And then we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Book of Acts. And then all, all, about the middle of the book of Acts, Paul starts doing all this stuff he's doing. And he says, as I wrote for a few words, when, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Well, I believe wholeheartedly, and if you think I'm wrong, just write me and tell me why. That in Acts chapter 9, Paul was made to understand the mystery of Christ. Hold on to Ephesians 3 and go back to Romans 16. Romans 16. I don't know how in the world this hour can be so short. Romans 16, as he winds up writing the Romans letter, he says this in verse 25. He says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, that's right here, all this time, Kept secret. Which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. So I know that when he wrote Romans, at least when he wrote Romans, he was making that mystery manifest. So I look at Romans, and the first eight chapters is all about the basics of the gospel of Christ. As the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, and he writes eight chapters explaining it. You know why it took eight chapters? Because nobody had ever heard it before. 
it took a lot of explanation, which you, as an Ephesian, really benefit from because you go back and read the book of Romans. It's got your gospel in it. Now, here's the thing. Paul said, if you read, he said to the Ephesians, if you read chapter 1 and chapter 2, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So here's Romans explaining the mystery of Christ. Now the hymns of power establish you according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. And when he revealed this mystery, the Romans, the Galatians, the Philippians, Thessalonians, Bereans, all those people, Corinthians, Ephesians, church number one in Acts chapter 19, they all understood why Christ could save them. <coughs> the mystery of Christ. But that didn't answer why could Christ save the Ephesians. That didn't answer that. Go back to Ephesians 3 now. I want to paraphrase this and you just tell me if I'm wrong. You can write me a letter, you can call me up, you can do anything you want to tell me if I'm wrong. He says, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Well, the, the, a few words explaining the mystery of Christ to the Ephesians is in chapter one and chapter two. But there's a portion of it that they won't understand. They won't understand why me. Why me? I, I never went to a Jew. Why me? I'm not in that other number. I wasn't a, a, those who first trusted Christ. Why did me trusting Christ save me? Now back up one phrase, verse 3. How that by revelation, he, that's God, made known unto me the mystery. Well, that term, the mystery, is what requires that semicolon. That mystery is not the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ was explained in Romans. These people need to understand what mystery did Paul make known unto, or did the Lord make known unto Paul that got them saved? Now go to chapter 6. Chapter 6. He describes for these people the armor of God, and then he describes for them a mystery. Notice verse 18. The end of the, of the uh, armor. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Mystery of what? The mystery of the gospel. How come these Ephesians received the gospel? The mystery of the gospel will tell you why they got it. The mystery of Christ, you see, Christ wasn't a mystery in his coming. They all knew he was coming. That's why most of them denied him, because they didn't want him to come yet. They wanted him to come their way. But they all knew the Savior was on his way. They all knew to look for a Messiah. Everyone who knew the Word of God knew that there was one coming who would uh, crush the head of Satan from Genesis chapter 3 on. They all knew. They knew the Word of God. They knew about Messiah coming. That wasn't a mystery that Christ was coming. However, that he came to die for the sins of many, that was a mystery. And that he was raised from the dead in order to justify those who believed in him? That was a mystery. But Paul explained that in Romans. That's not the mystery of the gospel. That's the mystery of Christ. It is the gospel. But it was the mystery of Christ. So what is the mystery of the gospel? Uh, the word of means in association with. The mystery in association with Christ was the gospel. Well, what's the mystery of the gospel? 
It's a mystery that is in association with that gospel. So let's see if we can find it. Ephesians chapter 1. We got seven minutes here, so we're going to have to rush through this. We may have to all stand up and, and run through this. Verse 3, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Now, if you're going to set out today to figure out how to be holy and without blame before Christ in love, how would you do that? Would you just clean up all your life and get rid of all the sins and God would just have to look at you holy and without blame before him? Is that the way you do it? I don't think that'll cut it. I don't mean to burst your bubble. Don't think that'll cut it. So keep that phrase in mind and keep reading. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. How did we get to be God's children? Jesus Christ adopted us according to the good pleasure of his will. It was God's idea, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he, that's God, made us accepted in the beloved. Oh, wow. I think I'm beginning to understand how I can be holy without blame before him. I didn't do it. God did it. Oh, God did it. Keep reading. To the pray, uh, verse of seven. In whom, in Christ, the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to, that'll do it. If the sins are gone, I don't have a problem being holy without blame before him in love. So in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians 1, same kind of people would be reading Colossians as was reading Ephesians. Look at the phraseology difference here. And by the way, when the Ephesians got their letter, they would have already had the privilege of the Colossian letter. Those towns are not far apart. Verse 9, Colossians 1, 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to, be, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet, there, the Father is doing it again, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, as in Ephesians 2, verse 6, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And here's the biggie, late in the chapter. Verse 25, the, to the body of the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. When Paul got done writing, there wasn't any more writing. Paul fulfilled the word of God. Verse 26, even the mystery. This is the mystery of the gospel. This is not the gospel. It's the mystery of the gospel. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Folks, if you want to know the abundance of revelations Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, get a grip on that verse right there. Verse 27. His saints, to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Think about it. Here's all these saints, 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 saints all through time. Even the church body of Christ of Jew and Gentile life between Acts chapter uh, 9 and Acts chapter 28. Saints, saints, saints. And here's a bunch of far off Gentiles being thrown in there and numbered with them just as if they were the same. That is a big mystery. And it's the mystery of the gospel. It'll save anybody, anywhere, under any circumstance. There is no one to be excluded from the gospel of Christ, the power of God and salvation, not a soul. One of the greatest things I was ever taught, and I must have heard it 53,000 times. Every now and then, Brother Moore would get on a high horse and he'd say, 
the best thing all you young preachers can do is go run a rescue mission for two years. And I said, yeah, right, like we can all go find a rescue mission we can run. Well, I didn't mind the thought of running the rescue mission, but I had no idea what he was talking about. I really didn't. And so he'd tell me stories from time to time, as he did everybody. And when I get those stories, I think, man, oh, man, oh, man. So it dawned on me one day that I kept walking past a building that was not in use, and I knew a man who knew the owner. So I go to that man and I say, hey, what's he paying in taxes for that empty building sitting down there? He said, oh, about $1,200 a year. So I said, can I, can I get his phone number for you? He said, yeah, I'll give you anything about buying the building. No. I offered him $100 a month for that commercial building. I said, I'll pay you taxes. Been sitting there for three years. I'll pay you taxes. He said, okay. Rented it to me for hundred dollars a month, probably worth eight or nine hundred. I don't know, but he gave me that building. I took a piece of cardboard and a marker, and I wrote Bible Counseling Center. I called a lawyer friend of mine, and I said, "Hey, what do you have to do? What do you have to uh, buy to start a Bible Counseling Center?" He said, "Well, are you going to sell anything?" I said, "No." He said, "You going to take up a collection?" I said, "No." He said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to talk to people about the Bible if they let me. He said, put the sign on the door and open that sucker up. So I did. And I had people come in who would have gone, come from a rescue mission and be headed out to the streets. And when I was down there at night, I saw everything that walked the streets in Mobile. I was teaching a Bible class there one night and a, <clears throat> shall we say, a lady of the evening come up to the window, the far end of the building, used it like a mirror, and she was putting lipstick all over. And then about the time she finished getting lipstick all over her ample lips, she looked in and saw all of us. And she waves real big, and then steps up that window and puts her lipstick pucker right on the glass. So that when I finished Bible class, everybody in there saw that. They want to know if I had a girlfriend on the street and all that sort of thing. You know that the next day, the next day, that woman came by to apologize for that. And I said, why do you want to apologize for it? She said, well, I was invading your privacy. I said, it's a wide open Bible class. Why don't you come to Bible class? She said, I don't think the Bible and me are going to get along. And I said, why not? The Bible gets along with everybody. She said, God don't like me. I said, that's a lie. She said, what? I said, that's a lie. God sent his son to this earth, and he loved you so much he died for your sins, and he has already paid for all of your sins. She stormed away from me as hard as she could go. Never saw her again. Why am I telling you this? I'm talking about what we are in the flesh and what Christ saves anyway. Anyway, he saved us anyway. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How difficult is that? What do you got to believe? Believe that he died for your sins. How difficult is that? What would, what would, what would that do for me, for him? Well, I had a young man one time back when I was pretty stupid. Well, I'm not very much smarter now. But he asked me, well, what would that do for me if he died for my sins? Big deal, he died for my sins. I said, yes, but he didn't stay dead. God the Father raised him from the dead and promised if you believe his son, he raised you from the dead. And he stomped off. There's about another 45 minutes of that story. We'll leave that one go. But what I'm trying to get you to understand is the mystery of it all. You know, we sing a song every now and then called The Wonder of It All. Well, the mystery of it all outstrips the word wonder. How wonderful, how marvelous is the grace of God, etc., etc. I know all those words. I sing all those songs. But let me tell you something. The mystery of the gospel is that it would even to reach to me and you. I hope you've gotten something good out of this Bible class. hope it's been helpful to you. 
I hope you understand what the mystery of the gospel is. <laughs> and I hope you understand why some things in the first part of what Paul wrote are not used in the second part of what Paul wrote and vice versa. And we'll get back to that next week. A little more about the difference in the books and a little more about who we are in Christ. That Christ in you, the hope of glory thing keeps ringing around in my head here. It's like we're not done with it. So I thank you all for being here. I'm going to stop this recording now.